Good morning, church, and welcome to our announcements for Sunday, July the 26th. My name is Tyler, and I'm the discipleship pastor here at Westview. And we just want to say a special welcome to all of you who are watching this this morning or whenever it is that you find yourself watching this. Thank you for being a part of our worship service. Thank you for worshiping in your homes. And we are so glad that we have this chance to connect with you. And we'd love to be able to connect with you. And one of the ways that we'd love to be able to do that, given the times that we find ourselves in, is we've got this email, and it's just connect at westviewbaptistchurch.ca. The information will be on the screen below me. And we'd love for you just to say who you are, introduce yourself. If you've never connected with us before, if you've somehow found our church online, we'd love to know who you are. We'd love to know that you're watching. And if there's anything that we can do to care for you, to meet needs for you, or just to, to share our story of who we are as Westview, please feel free to reach out to us. I just want to remind you of a few important announcements as we get going here this morning. Church, the first one is our lead pastor congregational survey. You've likely seen this on our website. We've had it sent out by email over the last few weeks. And tomorrow is the last day for you to complete this. And so we would encourage any of the members of your household to take a few moments. It doesn't take long to fill out this survey. If you go to our website and you click under the news tab, you can find the survey. It's right there. And we'd love for you to be able to share a little bit more about your insight as we continue our discernment process towards a new lead pastor in the coming months. We want to remind you as well that on Sunday, August the 9th, is our next communion service on the lawn. It'll be at 10 a.m. and we'd love to have you come as we share in the elements and as we gather together here on our property as the church. Just as a reminder, you do need to sign up for this event as is required by AHS. And so please go to our website, go to our events tab. All the information is there and you can sign up and we'd love to see you on Sunday, August the 9th at 10 a.m. And church, the last thing I want to let you know about this morning is something exciting. And it is an at-home serve event. On August the 16th, our, our student ministry uh, will be engaging in this at-home serve event. Many of you are aware, Serve is a week-long missions opportunity that our student ministry typically goes on every year. And this past summer, it was canceled in light of COVID. And so this year, our denomination, in partnership with the Mustard Seed, are collecting materials for backpacks. And you're going to have the chance to be able to bring those materials or donate financially. And more information will be coming out in the next few days by email and on our website. If you'd like to know anything more about how you can be involved, speak with Tosh, and she'd love to share this with you. Church, I want to invite us to pray right now as we transition into this time of our offering. So pray with me, church. Jesus, I thank you. That in as much as for many of us, these are very challenging times, you are still God and you are still calling us on mission. There are so many incredible ways where we have opportunity to continue to partner with you, to be about the work that you are doing. And I thank you for those. I thank you for those who are giving faithfully. Lord, thank you that these funds will continue to fuel the work of your mission so that others may know the good news of Jesus and hear of the gospel. And so thank you, Lord, that we can continue to worship you this way. I pray, Lord, as we continue now, that you would bless this offering, that we would see you at work, and we would give you praise. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great to be back with you again, church. My name is Tyler, and I'm the discipleship pastor here at Westview. And this morning, we continue in our series we're calling By Faith, as we look at a number of the lives of these individuals that Hebrews 11 records as having lived by faith. And this morning, we're looking at Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6, which speaks of a man named Enoch. And seeing as there's very little written about Enoch in the scriptures, you can probably be assured this won't be a lengthy sermon. Well, We'll see about that. Do you know how much is actually written in the scriptures about Enoch? Outside of these two verses in Hebrews 11, if you go to Genesis and you quickly skip over the genealogical portion of Enoch's life and family tree, you essentially get one verse. One verse that describes the life of this man. That and one reference to him found in Jude 14. 
But that's it. That is what is said of Enoch in Genesis. Let's read it this morning in Genesis 5, verse 24. It says, Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more, because God took him away. I wasn't joking when I said this morning, church, it's going to be a short sermon. But in as much as there isn't much written about Enoch in our scriptures, I think there is still much that we can learn from this man. Pray with me, church, as we begin. Jesus, thank you for this morning, for this time that we have together as the church to worship you together in our homes. And I pray, Lord, as we spend time in your word, that you would speak to us. You would reveal your truth to us that we would look upon the life of this man, Enoch, and seek to follow what is said of him, that he walked faithfully with you, God. We pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. We can probably divide this message in about two parts. The first point being that Enoch walked faithfully with God. And the second, as it records in Genesis, that he was not, because God took him this what awaits all of us if we follow faithfully the Lord, this eternal life. And so this morning, let's look at this first part, that Enoch, in point one here, that Enoch walked faithfully with God. I remember at some point in my life of pastoral ministry, I was asked during this leadership exercise to to write out my eulogy. And I know it kind of seemed a little morbid at the time, and I, I kind of felt like channeling my inner Monty Python and just kind of screaming out, I'm not dead yet. But this exercise, its point was to help us as leaders to to focus on what would or could be said of us as leaders, pastors, fathers, husbands, etc. Hoping that what was said hypothetically about yourself would then inspire you to actively live that out in our present tense. Most of us were pretty long-winded in our eulogies and no shock there, I'm sure, coming from a group of pastors. But it's why the story of Enoch is so wonderful because it's so incredibly brief and simple. You see, what is said of Enoch is that he walked faithfully with God. I can't think of a more poetic, magnificent way of summing up one's life. And I don't know about you, but I think if we're honest, we'd be pretty stoked to have the same thing said of us when our time on earth was done. But perhaps before we go much further this morning, we we need to get to know this man a bit more. So who really was Enoch? Well, Enoch was the great, 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 great grandson of Adam. He was Noah's great grandfather. And we'll take a look at Noah next Sunday. Enoch lived this holy and faithful life to the Lord And at 65 years of age, Enoch became the father of Methuselah, who goes on to be the longest living man recorded in Scripture. And in the story of Enoch in Genesis 5, we read of this moment in his life of becoming a father, that it was the seminal moment for him, a moment for him that changed the trajectory of his life for the rest of his time on earth. And it became for him this catalyst for holy living. In total, Enoch lived 365 years on earth. And although we don't have a lot of additional information about what exactly transpired, aside from the birth of his son, to bring about this radical change in his life, we know that from our own personal moments, our our own personal experiences, these types of, of seminal moments, if you would, that they can draw us closer to God as well. Perhaps it was a wedding day, or for you, the birth of a child. Maybe it was the loss of a loved one, or or maybe a major geographical move. Any and all of these moments can spark the fire of our faith. But given the limited amount of information we have written on Enoch, there's not much more we know about this man, other than, again, that he walked with God. So for the last bit of our, this part of our message this morning, I want us to look at what it means to walk with God. And I want to suggest for you four things that I think will help us to better understand this concept and its application from this man's life. 
The first part is that walking with God means moving in the divine direction. You see, walking alongside God is to walk with God. And to be with means to be in the presence of and going in the direction of. I like the imagery here used of moving in the divine direction. That there isn't this idea of stagnancy or, or even lagging, but an implied movement towards. The second thing is that walking with God means being in agreement with God. I personally don't tend to walk with others who I'm not in agreement with. If that were true, I'd likely walk away from them, not with or towards them. The third thing is that walking with God means that there's this mutual trust. If I'm out, if I'm out walking with someone, there's this sense of mutual trust that, that the person I'm with cares for me and isn't going to do anything to bring upon harm on my life. Here in our text, a man trusted God, and God trusted him. And lastly, this morning, that walking with God means keeping in step with him. Here again is this imagery used of, of being with. If we're running ahead, we're not truly with God on the walk. Same goes if we're lagging behind it's much like what the Apostle Paul said when he reminded the Galatians in Galatians 5. He said in 5.22, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. You see, the scriptures use this imagery, this language of, of keeping in step as a means of illustrating what an obedient and faithful life looks like for a believer. Enoch walked with God by faith. And his life was a life that pleased God. And what is even more amazing, that is for you and I, we're lucky to maybe get about 80 years on this earth. 90, if we're really fortunate. 80 to 90 years where what is asked of us is to faithfully follow God and live a life by faith that pleases him. And I know that for many of us, that seems like an onerous task. But Enoch walked faithfully with God for 300 years. And I think the only way we can say that this is possible is that this was done by faith and faith alone. And so that brings us this morning then to our second point. The language used surrounding Enoch's departure from this earth is unique to him and only one other individual in scriptures. Our second point this morning reflects that scripture from Genesis where it says he was not because God took him. Let's read the passage of scripture on Enoch from Hebrews 11. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe. And a reminder for us again to, uh, to look at this passage in Genesis. So let's read that as well together in Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Enoch experienced what each of us experience who live by faith in the Son of God. What awaits all of us if we follow faithfully God is life eternal in the heavenly Father's presence. Yet this entrance into glory is unique to himself and only one other person in the entirety of scripture. Enoch is only one of two people taken straight into heaven, escaping death altogether. The second one from our scriptures is Elijah, this famous prophet who received a heavenly chariot of fire that took him away into heaven after his ministry had finished, leaving Elisha to carry on this mission. And you can read of that more in 2 Kings 2. And while many of us might look upon the life of the great prophet Elijah and say, oh, okay, sure, his life seems to be one fitting of such an entrance into glory. But, but why Enoch? Like, what made him so special? 
And I don't know about you, but I think that when many of us get to look at these genealogical parts of our scriptures, we're quick to glance over them. But most of us don't spend that much time digging deeper. We just read them like so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, and so-and-so was the father of so-and-so, and, and it's not really interesting to us if we're honest. And chapter 5 in Genesis is a re record of the descendants from Adam all the way to Noah. And from Cain, who we looked at last Sunday, if you go seven generations, you arrive at a fellow named Lamech. Lamech was a polygamist and boasted of his murder to his wives in, in Genesis chapter 4. Essentially, Lamech was a pretty messed up guy. But if you follow seven generations from Seth, who was born to Adam and Eve after the death of Abel, you arrive at Enoch. Seven generations. This number seven is significant in Christianity as this number of, of perfection or, or rather completion. There's seven generations from Cain to Lamech. And there's seven generations from Seth to Enoch. And we see in the scriptures this contrast of these two genealogies. One that led to destruction and one that led to faithfulness and a life pleasing to God. And so God enacts only one of the two times in scriptures this means of an individual escaping death. And Enoch is taken from the earthly scene into the life beyond. How? We're not really made aware. But why? I think because Enoch walked by faith with God. We read in our text this morning that his life pleased God. And as we begin to bring our message to a close, I want to spend a few moments this morning focusing on verse 6 of our passage this morning. Let's read that one more time together. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe. What is important for us not to forget, in, in a series where we're looking at these individuals who are found in, in the hall of faith, as it's often called, is at the end of the day, yes, they were special. Yes, they were significant. But no, they were not perfect. These are individuals who, yes, accomplished great things, but they did so because of the great faith they had in God. By his power at work in and through them. Not simply by their own intellect or by their strength or their charisma, instead of because of their faith. You and I, we can look upon these stories and we can feel in our hearts like we're second-class citizens, that we're lesser than Christians. We can look upon the story of Enoch and think, oh, wow, how, would it, how amazing would it be to escape death like that? But think with me for a moment here. Is it not true that all Christians essentially escape death? Look at uh, what it says in John eleven twenty five 25 and 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will, li will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, we'll die in the common sense of the word. But truly, earth was never meant to be our home. We're only here temporarily. Our citizenship is in heaven and Enoch may be one of the least spectacular individuals in all of Scripture, yet he remains equally one of the most godly men in the entire Old Testament. One final legacy of Enoch is almost a throwaway verse found in the book of Jude, verse 14. It says this, it says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. For a man with little known about him, how incredible to see that at some point in the Old Testament, he prophesied the second coming of Jesus. Enoch lived a life of faith, a life that pleased God, and he knew it. He lived a life of faith despite many of the pressures and the temptations from the outside world that surrounded him. 
and he held fast to his faith. And God held fast to him. And so it raises the question, church, are we living lives that are pleasing to God? Are we walking faithfully with him? And if not, it simply begins by having faith in God. And that he sent his son Jesus to forgive us of our sins and to offer for us eternal life. That we too one day could find ourselves in the presence of our heavenly father. That he would be pleased with us. Not because of what we've done. Not because of our intellect, not because of our accolades, not because of anything else, but because we simply had faith in him. We believed in him and that we walked faithfully. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this challenge from the life of Enoch, a man who pleased you, who walked faithfully with you. And I pray that we too would be found faithful. That we too would live lives pleasing to you. And that begins by having faith. Faith in who you said you are and what you did. That you sent Jesus to this earth. To die the death we should have died. To live the life we could not live. But yet for those who believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Thank you for that promise. Let us cling to that this morning and for every day from this point forward. We pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.